a recent viral post by a microblading artist claiming to have infected clients with HIV. You know, misinformation has, you know, been rampant. And to shed some light on the story here for us this morning, we ha are going to engage health advocate um, as well as medical student, fourth year medical student at EUNAM, that is Ms. Uh, Tulika Andreas. A very good morning, madam. How are you? I'm well. How are you, ma'am? Thank uh, you so much for the welcome. All right. Great stuff. I'm also very well. Thank you so much. You know, there's so much to talk about here because I was actually saying to Denver earlier, I happen to have missed this video. And at the same time, you know, this is like some scary stuff that came out from this video, you know. But I think yeah. it would be only fair for us to start with you explaining the basics, uh, uh, you know, to us of how HIV is transmitted, you know, and clarify any misconceptions that people might have, especially when, especially when we're talking about, you know, uh, of it in a cosmetic um, way, like this microblading procedure? Mm. I think this whole microblading thing is actually very important that it came out because now people are starting to have the important conversation around HIV. And of course, with transmission, we know that HIV is bloodborne, meaning that it is transmitted through the exchange of blood um, and it does not survive outside the host. However, it can also be transmitted through um, vaginal or seminal fluid. And so in the cases of any exchange of one person's blood that is infected with HIV to another person, it confirms that that person can indeed be infected with HIV. So we have various methods in which this can be transmitted. So one, first of all, is through sexual contact, as we, we all know. Um, whether vaginal, anal, or oral. This is because um, the mucous membrane that lies the vagina, the anal canal, and the oral cavity are very fragile. And so if there are any bleeds or cuts or sores there, the HIV um, virus can transmit through those roots. However, we also have now the sharing of contaminated needles, mm -hmm. contaminated bleeds, or contaminated syringes. So here it's very important to understand one thing. Yes, HIV can indeed be transmitted through these methods. However, we need enough concentration of the virus and the blood that is infected to transmit the virus. And it's also important to note that HIV is very fragile, right? So when exposed in the environment, it means that it can easily dry out and die. It needs to be within the cells to replicate. So chances of getting HIV actually from procedures like microblading do exist. For sure, they do exist. However, they are very rare. Mm. But in this case, as we heard now from the confession, this lady has been tampering with the blade. That mm. means that actually there are chances that she is indeed infecting her clients with the virus. So it's important that we understand that concept there, that there they are chances of her actually being able to transfer this virus to her clients. Mm. No, definitely. I think, I don't know if that's just selfish or just scary. It's just a little insane. But let's also talk about, you know, um, the, 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 the importance and how important it is for Namibians to be aware of, you know, PrEP, like the pre-exposure, you know, PrEP and PEP uh, pretty much. And, um, you know, what role it plays in overall, the overall strategy for HIV prevention? Yeah, so with pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, these have been very fundamental in the prevention of the transmission of the HIV virus because of the role they play in curbing the transmission itself. So we see now with pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's basically the antiretroviral drugs that the normal HIV patients take that are given to somebody who's at risk of being infected. So that means that this person is HIV negative first of all, is tested and confirmed to be HIV negative, but it's in, an, it's in a serodiscordant relationship, meaning that their partner is HIV positive, also confirmed. Or is a, is a patient who is involved in risky sexual behavior and has multiple concurrent sexual partners. However, we do not give it to patients who have not been proven to be HIV positive or have abnormal kidney functions. As you all know that these um, antiretroviral drugs have effects on your kidneys um, as well as on your liver for some. So for pre-exposure prophylaxis, it would usually take at least seven days of daily dosing for it to reach adequate levels in the rectum and about 21 days for the vagina. So for these patients, they need to take it for at least a month. And if they do want to stop it, they need to take it for another month after being exposed to a potential HIV infection. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So really, it is important um, that patients do start on pre-exposure prophylaxis if they know that they are at risk. Mm. However, for healthcare workers, we don't just give pre-exposure prophylaxis like that. We also combine it with now um, the HIV testing packages. We um, combine it with uh, male and female condoms and lubricants, as well as ensuring that the, the partner is tested. In addition, we also ensure that the patient um, is educated or counseled on going for voluntary circumcision as well as um, STI treatment and prevention. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. On oh. the other hand, in terms of now the post exposure prophylaxis, this one, the beauty of the HIV virus is that it doesn't immediately replicate when the patient is infected. So it goes through a window period, and this window period allows healthcare workers to intervene. So it's usually about three months. So if you take post exposure prophylaxis, at least within one to two hours, post-exposure and not less than 72 hours, your chances of being protected from actually getting the virus are high. Mm-hmm. So really it's important that the public and the general community understands how these two um, methods of prevention work because it's made great strides in preventing the transmission of HIV. Mm. Thank you so much for that bit of uh, information there. Now, just getting back to this viral post once again. Now, let's say, for instance, you know, well, what advice can you give, you know, to somebody who is considering microblading or any cosmetic surgery to ensure, obviously, you know, like their safety, their well-being? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the cosmetic industry, I think it's one of those industries that are very poorly regulated in Namibia. I mean, everybody is starting something. It's either they are doing brows or lashes or they are doing tattooing, even barbers. All these things pose risk because they are using blades, um, sometimes in needles as well. So I really advise people in the community to ensure that the esthetician or technician who's doing their um, microblading or so on is licensed, first of all. So before you go to somebody, ensure that they have received the adequate training that they need to carry out that procedure. Also, you look at the environment of the person. Is it clean? Is it well sterilized? Are the things that they are using coming out of newly packaged um, products? Or is it just something that they are taking from there and using on you? So all these things are really important. And you should also insist that the technician opens needles, syringes, or blades in front of you instead of them um, keeping your eyes closed throughout the procedure and you not seeing what exactly is being done. So I really encourage people to be more um, vicarious, really, about their health and to just be looking at the person in the, um, in the whole process very carefully. And so at the same time, also communicate your concerns with the esthetician and inform her, him or her that you are really afraid of contracting any risky things through this procedure so, so that they know that you're actually very afraid and they will take extra precautions mm-hmm. with you. Some even say that you should actually ask to be first on the line for the day just so you, you're sure that everything you're receiving has not been tampered with and everything that's being used, they're the first um, that is being used on. So really, the fact that it's poorly regulated means that uh, the client needs to be the one who is more involved in ensuring that the sterility of the procedure as well. Mm. Thank you, madam. Now, as a health, you know, um, advocate, how do you pretty much address stigma around HIV, and how do you uh, think, you know, uh, what what steps can we take to, you know, uh, um, create a more informed community? So, um, indeed, over the years, we've seen that the treatment and management of HIV, sorry, the management of HIV and prevention of HIV has really gotten much better, especially within the Namibian context. However, it's important that when we are addressing the stigma surrounding HIV, that we understand that it's no longer life-threatening per se because of these advances now that have, that have been made in medicine. So, people can actually avoid progressing to AIDS by taking their antiretroviral therapy. And at the same time, they can then live long and healthy lives and can build families and so on. So I think this understanding is very important because we still find people in the community who look at people who are infected with HIV or living with HIV and think automatically that this person is going to die very soon or this person is very ill and I can indeed contract HIV from them. So it's really important that we mitigate this um, false belief or stigma that's surrounding people living with HIV. At the same time, we want to encourage 
people that it's important that they practice safe sex, first of all, and avoid risky behavior. And this can only be done when there's a radical approach to basically mitigating stigma. So we should be open enough and confident enough and free enough to have conversations surrounding HIV, to have conversations surrounding contraceptive usage, safe sex, and all these things amongst our friendship groups, amongst our community leaders, amongst general public, um, general public indeed. So platforms like social media, platforms like Good Morning Namibia, platforms um, way in which a lot of people tune in, especially young people, are what we need to target. And especially now with healthcare workers, we need to take extra steps, of course, when things like the whole microblading scene break out, we need to be the ones to come on the scene and address any misconceptions, address any um, arguments that are false um, that would either support or be against the transmission of HIV. So, indeed, it, I think it really needs a radical approach from everybody in the community, especially those who are trained to advise and advocate for health issues. Having said that, you know, what would you say are some of the most effective ways to uh, pretty much edu educate the public on, you know, HIV prevention, overall health, and so on? Yeah, I think definitely the most effective way would just to go, to go out into the public and to ensure that people have access to information. We have been doing that for many years. However, we need more strategic approaches way in which we allow people to understand things at their level. Things like um, preventing stigma, um, for instance, telling people that, you know, sharing a social piece, um, hugging, touching somebody who is HIV infected will not necessarily confer you to getting the virus, you know, all these things. Allowing people to understand things at their level, but also teaching people um, ways in which they can prevent themselves from getting infected and fully understanding things like pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, especially for those um, constantly at risk of being exposed to the HIV infection. Um, but I've also noticed that mostly people in destitute communities do not have access to this information. So it's really up to us as a nation to either go out yeah. to those communities and try and inform people or sit at home with our small communities when we go to the villages sit with our grannies and the young ones and really just try to have conversations around these topics because yeah. they are indeed Thank you. the ones who are well, thank you so yeah. much, Miss Andreas. It was so nice uh, speaking with you this morning. I hope you have a lovely day. I hope the weather is great there in Valfus Bay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Ta-ta. So uh, there you have it. We have that was a health advocate, Miss um, uh, Tulika Andreas, talking to us about, you know, microblading and HIV prevention and transfer thereof, uh, considering the viral uh, video that we were speaking about earlier. All right. So uh, we hope you took a lot from that uh, talk and we continue after this.